trying to spike a piece of furniture in the dark, but um, it's not so great for if you don't want the audience to see it. Now also, another problem too is I'm a stagehand. I'm typically bringing in furniture from offstage to onstage, down, and then going downstage here. What's my problem right now? It's, it's covered. Yeah, it's offside. It's, I can't see it because I have to. Oh, there it is. Now, if the, if the spike marks are back here, yes, because it just bam, I can, I can look down, I can see exactly where they are. I don't have to set it down and then peer over here and check this side and then check this side. So, yeah, you know, little details, but little details add up. They're important. And of course, you know, sometimes too we have you know, other uses for uh, spike tape, um, for glow tape in this instance. I mean, obviously we need three spikes on those guys here too. Um, aesthetically, you know, for, for looks, I'm not a huge fan of this, but we have put glow tape all on the edges here because we have a couple of actors that have pretty bad night vision and we don't want anyone tumbling off the edge in the dark. That would be, that would, that would be very sad. Uh, uh, not happy campers. I have a question. Yes. Why, why platforms? Why platforms? Yes. To be honest, there are a lot of, a lot of potential reasons for why platforms. Um, because, well, here, there's a couple things let's play. I mean, a, you can see like, it has a space here. There's a scene, there are some scenes being played here over in this corner. That's why you have chairs over there. There's some scenes being played over there in that corner. Separate scenes. Why have separate lights on them? So I can have a pool of lights come up here, some lights come up there, play different scenes. So, why did I then build all of these extra platforms to put these walls for the main, the main box set on? Why didn't I just paint this on the floor and then save myself a whole lot of work and trouble? To like signify that it's a whole different like room. Yeah. Very good yeah. Exactly. It's a, it's a really great separation, right? Uh, let me let me tell you also one thing too. Is I found that I mean, like, and, and the levels are really important. We talk about levels in design. We talk about levels in direction or in acting. Levels are about what height someone is at. So I'm down here. I'm at one level. I'm at stage level. I'm up here, all of a sudden I'm 12 inches higher up here. So, and that's really important, I mean, because that can create visual interest for everyone. It's like, you know, that, that if everyone's just standing at one level, it can just look like a sea of bodies. But if people can actually have different levels they're standing at, that can be quite visually interesting and compelling for the audience. But, as you said, Main reason for the large separation here is to create distance visually in the, uh, for the audience between spaces down here and up here. Now I'm in this space. So, yeah. Now, here's another question to get a little more specific. Why did I go with 12 inches? Because again, here I'm just making more work for myself because these platforms are naturally framed to be six inches high or the average step height. So I could have just made it six inches high, left all the legs off of them, and then saved myself some work and some materials. So why 12 inches? You have the seats go higher. Was that the seats? Do, yeah, well, the seats do go higher. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a good point. Here they'd be, the, we have what's called a rake. A rake is basically, it's maybe where you guys are seated, our auditorium, it's not flat, it's at an angle or a rake there. And here we have a pretty steep rake or a pretty high angle. Um, so that's one thing, yes, yeah, so then that's one thing to get these played higher up here too. But, I'll tell you, the reason for the 12 inches is because Six inches is again what 
the, one of the average heights of a step. So if I made everything six inches, it would look like a step. But if I make something 12 inches, there's no step that, you know, like steps are not made to be 12 inches high because, I mean, I can step up here, but it's really awkward and unwieldy. If I put it down at six inches, visually, and then people would subconsciously, even if they hadn't really been thinking about it properly, they would say, oh, six inches, oh, that looks like a step. Which would not, then again still make it look like part of the rest of the stage environment. But by making it 12 inches, it makes, yes, exactly, it makes it, it, makes it separate. So, yeah. Don't. Any other questions, comments, considerations? <laughs> I don't know what sort of time frame you're uh... Um, No, we're still doing good. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there is anything. Oh, furniture. Furniture. Tell yes. me a bit about the furniture. Uh, well, furniture, I mean, admittedly, working in a sp place like this with uh, low budgets and whatnot, we often end up just having to uh, get what we have our hands on. Um, but. Above and beyond that, I mean, there is the consideration of, yeah, furniture, sofas, love seats, all the stuff we hang on walls or whatnot or put on the furniture, what we, what we, you know, what we hang up and whatnot. Now, the, the question, there are, there are two questions that, well, at least two questions, the two remain and most important questions that pop into my head when I'm thinking about all this stuff and what goes on the walls and what's, what we use as furniture. And those are two things. First off, what's, what's the aesthetics, you know, or the visual quality of this? I mean, like, where, where am I putting the sofa? What's the sofa look like? How does the color of the sofa tie in with everything else? You know, what is, you know, what, um, you know, what are the colors, you know, say you have a chair like this, how does that look everything, do, does the furniture match? What's the overall visual effect? But that's just one question. If I just stuck myself on that question, I'd be an interior decorator. I hope they're a pretty good one, but, <laughs> that's, you know, but there's a second question I have to ask myself, and this is, one of the things that clearly separates the work that I do as a theatrical designer from an interior decorator. What is that? Hazard a guess? Yes? You built stuff? Well, yeah. Let's say, oh, I, yeah, from my time to time, too. But some, well, sometimes I don't. I mean, like, for example, these chairs and whatnot, we have these in storage, or we find other people who have stuff. You know, it actually, what it has to do with is that this is the scene of a story. The script and the, the people, imaginary people, played by actors, but still people nonetheless live here. And we are watching their story develop. So if I were an interior designer, I could just go to, say, a client and say, well, what color would you like these walls? And allow me to make some suggestions for you. I think a nice seafoam green with a white coffee brown molding would be excellent in this room and just make you feel wonderful. The closest thing I have to that, in this case, is the director, working with them. But really what I'm looking at is looking at the script and looking at the characters and saying, who lives here? What, you know, what, what, what does this, what, who lives here? What, what kind of furniture would they have? You know, would they, would they have, you know, would they be the kind of people who have something like this on their desk? Or, you know, this, I just can't get enough of this guy. This I lovely, know, I love the horse. This lovely I horse wine nice. holder right here. <laughs> you know, um, you, you, you kind of, I mean, you're, in some ways, you're having, I have to think of myself as doing, doing interior decorating for imaginary people and to, to think about what kind of environment they live in. At the same time, too, while holding on to all these other aesthetic ideas of, okay, like, well, I have, 
the, you know, the Lone Star flag that's in Texas still have the red, white, and blue and whatnot. But then above and beyond that, who are these people? Who lives here? What do you know? What do they do? Like you know, like what what sort of magazines would they have next to their desk? What sort of books would they have on their coffee tables? Some other stuff I still need to figure out and finish before we are completely done here. Which is, I think, kind of the certainly one of the kind of fun parts of it. Really, honestly, it's just um, exploring and trying to uh, trying to put yourself in the head of someone else. Maybe taking these imaginary characters in these imaginary situations and trying to see it in your head and then see what that environment looks like. Picture. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Cool. Does anyone have any more questions? No questions. Okay. Uh, when you make a set, like you have to like talk to the director, like, oh, what? Have I made the boss to set to look like? Or no, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, ultimately, the I mean, it, it's a process that goes from the playwright. I mean, who really, I mean, who ultimately writes out these characters, writes out the scenario, make, makes the play. So they describe the plot and the characters but it's still just words on a page. And then it passes through the director, and the director is really the person who ends up, they're the ones that would, hopefully, in, in, in most cases, this is the idea, the, the vision, the, the large idea in their head of, of what these characters are like, what this play is, and what, this, what the play is saying, what the mood is. And so my job then is to talk with the Director and ask them, and and then to try and take their larger, grander vision and translate that for myself into more specific choices that I can then make and build and and, and do to support that vision. Um, for example, this is a show. This is definitely a comedy. So. Just taking, for example, not, not, the, not the, um, the set design for a second, but take the lighting design. Um, if you look at it, it's a lot of warm light. It's a lot, it, it's well lit. There aren't a lot of shadows around here. Because what I could do is, you know, and Jenna talked earlier about how you can do cool and warm and a neutral. And you can change those in many ways. For example, I mean, you can have you can have two cools, um, and then you just have a very cool. Well, you have an extremely cold. Uh, it's that was a like serious, scary, often like scary environment. What you can do is like if I have if I have one one light source is very strong, I can cast strong shadows. Half of the, if I don't have that other, that other light there, that other diagonal light, then all of a sudden, I'll have everything on one side is filled in with shadow. And again, that's spooky and you know, not, you know, not very comforting. So, not a, really, not really a comedy, though. So, the idea here is to, you know, to minimize shadows, to keep, keep light warm, soft, and coming from a variety of you know, directions. Um, to also brighten things out, too. I mean, because, I, you know, I, and again, it's, it's, it may look predominantly like white light, um, but there's a lot of there, there's a lot of different colors around here. For, I mean, the main light I have coming from this direction is more of a rose, a rosy tint actually, and then coming from here, I have some some cooler but not too dark blues. I have some blues, dark blues here, backlighting. Backlighting is actually quite important because uh, it creates. Even if it's difficult to see, it creates just a little bit of a ring. You know, because when, when you light someone from the back, you, you basically then create this halo around them. They see this ring of light around around them. And that actually separates them from the from the rest of the background. So it creates depth. Um, you know, I've also added in some lavenders and magentas. And again, while well, you may not if you, if you can only see them if you hold up the light in certain angles here, but if I can catch that, 